Hello everyone, Count Zero here, and doing the vlog, the Legend of the Force vlog for Star Wars Episode, we are on 8 now, The Last Jedi. This is the final film featuring Carrie Fisher, and the middle installment of the new Star Wars trilogy. New director this time, Rian Johnson. I mean, to be honest, the original trilogy had different directors for every film anyway. Lucas in A New Hope. Um, Irvin Kirshner in The um, Empire Strikes Back. And then a additional director whose name, at least, Richard Marquand. Richard Marquand for Return of the Jedi. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years after Return of the Jedi came out. Is sad because I'd love to see where his career would have gone after that. Um, but anyway, nonetheless, we are this is our middle installment of the series. I've seen a bunch of Rian Johnson's films, not all of them, but I remember seeing Brick fairly early on and really enjoying it. And I was really interested in what we were going to get into here with him doing a big space opera epic like this. And I was not disappointed at all, at all, at all. Um, so, part of the reason why I'm not doing my usual episode of, of Legend of the Forest this week was, in this was, we had a bit in the trailers showing the Jedi Temple burning. Okay, okay, maybe we're going to get something of Luke's Jedi teaching methods here in this film. I am going to avoid major max spoilers. Forgive me for my hair and sort of disheveled appearance. I took a hooded sweatshirt off and then tends to do nasty things. Your visible composure. Anyway. Um, so, looking at Luke's training methods in the Force and that sort of thing here, how he trains compared to Obi-Wan, compared to Yoda, that sort of thing. And it's a very interesting take here on this. I'm not I'm going to avoid major spoilers on the film. I'm trying to avoid most minor spoilers, but I'm going to talk about some of this here with Luke's Jedi training style. Luke... As a Jedi, trains Leia. The comparison I'd make would be some of the Hong Kong martial arts films and that sort of thing. We had a bit of this with Yoda in Empire Strikes Back, where it's the old master who seems like a drunken layabout, or not, no, didn't seem drunk, but seems silly, seems unhelpful, unwise, um, worthless, until you come to realize that there is much more going on to this person than you first that, than you thought at first glance. It's the beggar so archetype, I believe is the term used. Um, and you see this, for example, in Legend of Drunken Master, and oh, and Luke has a different take on this. Um, oh, Obi Wan, the old warrior who's in retirement, who's called in for one last thing, uh, and he's he's aware of his limitations. He's willing to go, but aware of his limitations and his 
um, but is willing to, to work to fulfill his duty in spite of that. And it's a very samurai arc that means the first film is taking cues from the Hidden Fortress. Here it's the martial arts master, the, the old man, on, is much more of the old man of the mountain, which makes sense because Luke has deliberately become much more of a hermit than Obi-Wan ever was, and has extremely secluded himself. And the idea here that Luke doesn't want to train anyone else, as we have the trailer, he feels, you know, the trailer feels the Jedi should end. He's, he's done, and it's only through the insistence of the prospective pupil and the willing and, and the fact that they are showing their willingness to go to the extra miles and do what they show they want to take part in this training that they want to train they want to learn that they are a they are a truly willing pupil not just someone who just wants quick knowledge and will walk away it, the insistence that leads Luke to train Ray and it's a very interesting, we've basically gone through like the three big old master archetypes here. Um, kind of four. Look at the prequel trilogy with like Yoda, either Yoda or Mace Windu kind of being being the Shaolin Temple in like 26 Chambers of Shaolin and Shaolin Wooden Min and that sort of thing where it's the we're not gonna accept where it's we are stayed and established in our ways, and someone must kind of shake up our equilibrium to get us out of our ways, or that sort of thing. Not on an ultimately beneficial manner, because if we continue with the thirty six with the Shaolin Temple tradition, this would be the this would be the equivalent of Bushy Brows being the guy who opens up the thirty six who insist, says that they should create the thirty sixth chamber and train the populace in martial arts, not just the inductees, the, the the novitiate at the Shaolin Temple. So got that. Um and we it's it's interesting how we see Luke train um Ray here. Because he's not the Rian Johnson doesn't have Luke go through all the old stuff that we've done before. We, we see nothing that we'd previously established in the films. Um, whereas, like, for example, in the prequel trilogy, when we see the training at the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, we see little bits and pieces of stuff that we'd already seen in movies. Um, like, when we see the younglings in uh, Attack of the Clones, we have... Like they're doing the low-powered lightsaber with the um, with the uh, um, droid thing, with with the remote droid thing, where it's basically where you're you're focusing on the remote and screening out and screening out all distractions and that sort of thing to block the blaster bolts and that sort of stuff. And here it's a lot more unique stuff. I'm um, yeah, spoilers, so I'm not going to get into what the training methods are. We have certainly have callbacks. We have our own sort of equivalent of the cave sequence of the um, Dagobah, but with material that is more relevant to Rey and her backstory and her journey that she's going on through this trilogy. And it pays off well, and it is very visually distinct. It really goes to show this film that because of the march of technology and how things have progressed in terms of special effects between the original trilogy to the prequel trilogy to now, we're at a point where we can really get a good balance of digital and practical effects that all look good in combination and allow for really unique and interesting visuals. This comes up in this film's version of the Cade sequence. This comes up in several other shots in the film, which I'm you know, not going to spoil, but get a lot of really good mixes of practical and digital effects, which I really liked. 
As far as plots and other stuff goes, um, the main things that directly come to mind for this film that kind of have me um, wondering and stuff is, like, I enjoy this film a lot. It's a great film. It is a very good middle installment of the trilogy. And, but there's, there's still a couple questions left. I mean, there are obviously a lot of questions left in the middle installment. You want people coming back for the next movie. But the one thing that kind of was binging, dinging in the back of my head when I walked at the theater was, okay, Harry Fisher has passed away. And the studio said, we're not recasting Leia. We're not necessarily doing a digital double of Leia. So... You have to create a situation, film, where, long story short, you have to find a way to write Leia out of the series that feels emotionally right, that doesn't feel cheap, that fits with the narrative pace of the story and which doesn't feel like, oh, we had to cut this plot. We had to narratively cut this bits out of the story or anything like that. And we don't get that. There is a character who comes in, in the film, who comes across as they are going to be. No, look, let's just say that. It's, there are a couple thought characters who they set up to be Leia's replacement. To be. If they decide we're going to kill off Leia, this character is going to step in, take her place. And when that point comes in the film where we kill off Leia. That character is now set up to step up. But the film is inconclusive on that point. Whatever resolution they've decided for character of Princess Leia, what her fate will be, it will be in the third film and not in the second film. I hate to break this to you. It's like this is like the one spoiler I'm willing to break because this is a point which kind of which surprised me. It, it did surprise me, but it's not the surprise of oh the big plot twist from um, Empire Strikes Back. It wasn't going to be a big narrative plot twist for Leia and her path. Well, like, right, but Ray and her path that connects to, Le to Leia or something like that. It, it's what it's, there was no big twist that and there there, there was there, there, okay, this, there were big twists in this movie. There were big emotional moments in this movie, and there was points in this film like, oh, okay, I didn't see that coming. Even the one bit I did get spoiled. Um was a hell of a moment and really well done. And I'm not going to spoil any of the main narrative twists, but the question of Leia is a metatextual twist and one that kind of needs to be brought up. And so I'll say... If you come to this film looking like, I'm sorry, I, I spoil this bit here. I reveal this bit here. So you don't have to spend the rest of the film looking for, oh, this is going to be that scene. This is the moment when, the, when they resolve the question, the issue of the fact that one of their major actresses has passed away. And we need to remove them from the story in a, in a graceful manner. And this is that point. That shoe's not dropping in this film. With that said, there are still a lot of great emotional moments here. There are a couple great twists. 
that I really appreciated. And some people have called some of the twists in advance. Some people haven't. If you called it, you called it. If you didn't call it, you didn't call it. Um, some people who didn't call it, some of these twists, they may be disappointed by the fact that things didn't turn out the way they expected. But I think the film holds up very well. It is a, it is a very well done film. And I am glad that Rianne Johnson has, got th has been trusted with another three more Star Wars movies based on the film he put out here. He, I'd say, has earned that trust. I hope that those films turn out very well as well. I hope, for that matter, um, that Takeda Waititi, i probably mangling his name again, who directed Thor Ragnarok, based on performance there, he gets to spend more time in the Marvel Universe if he so chooses. Because he is an excellent director. I also want him to make We Are Wolves, the sequel to What We Do in the Shadows. But if he wants to come back to an MCU, if he wants another MCU paycheck and Disney's willing to, to sign the check, then I will appreciate whatever he chooses to do in that universe and what Brian Johnson chooses to do in this one. So, as far as Legends of the Force goes, January, we are returning to our regularly scheduled novels with the second installment of the Jedi Academy trilogy. In the sort of May of next year, we have the Han Solo film. That month, we will be taking a break from the books again to talk about the films. And this time, I'll be talking about this film in context with the Han Solo trilogy by Brian Daly. And also any other Han Solo novels I've gotten to around this point. There's the, Han, there's the other Han Solo trilogy, and we'll get to that when it, the time comes. So, until next time, thank you very much for watching. Again, I recommend seeing this film in theaters. There wasn't any point in this film which I thought this movie needed to be seen in 3D. IMAX, sure, but if you're like, oh, do I need to see this in 3D? It hurts my eyes. It doesn't work well with my glasses. Anything else like that. Don't worry about seeing it in 3D. IMAX, sure, 3D, don't sweat it. So, see you next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.